thank you guys so much for joining us. I know, as I mentioned, it's super early. Um, I know I personally don't usually wake up this early <laughs> with, um, with since the pandemic has started because I don't have to travel to school or work. Um, but thank you for joining um, this workshop. Uh, my name is Sarah Smurthwaite and I'm a second year full-time MBA student at UCLA Anderson. And I'm the outgoing executive vice president of WBC, so the Women's Business Connection at Anderson. And I've had the pleasure of working to put together today's event. So I'm super excited for this. Um, this workshop will include a 35 minute discussion followed by 25 minutes of Q&A. Um, and please use the Cvent platform that you're in right now to submit your questions for Melanie. And um, we'll go ahead and approve those and we'll upvote any questions and then we'll leave that to the end. So I will now introduce Melanie. Um, who will be leading today's workshop. So Melanie Ho is the author of Beyond Leaning In, Gender Equity and What Organizations Are Up Against, which is a unique business book um, written as a novel. She's also the founder of Strategic Innovation, a firm focused on leveraging the power of imaginative arts to drive organizational transformation. Melanie previously served as Senior Vice President of Research at EAB Global, an education advisory technology and services firm headquartered in Washington, DC. She led over 100 researchers and provided strategic operational and change management advice to more than 1,500 educational institutions worldwide, including 90% of the top news of the US News Top 100 Universities. Um, prior to her 12 years at EAB, Melanie received her PhD in English, um, MA in English and a BA in Policy and Media Studies from UCLA, so super exciting. Um, we're thrilled she can be with us here today. And Melanie, I will now hand it over to you and I will go ahead and turn my video off so you guys can see her in full screen. Great. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you to all the Velocity organizers for putting together this great event. I'm, as a UCLA alum in particular, so thrilled to be here. I'm going to talk a little bit today about some of the concepts related to allyship in my recently published book, uh, Beyond Leaning In, Gender Equity and What Organizations Are Up Against. So let me begin by talking a little bit about why I wrote a book called Beyond Leaning In and why I think the topic of allyship is so important. It began in 2013 when Sheryl Sandberg first released Lean In. And at first I was excited. Again, it was 2013. I was in my early 30s and I had just advanced into a senior leadership position at my job for the first time. I had gone from managing four people to over 70. It felt like almost overnight. And I was really trying to understand the different challenges that I felt like I was facing as a woman leader. And also as I looked at my team and noticed some of the barriers that I felt that the women on my team were facing that were different from what the men on my team were facing. And so at first, it, it was this really exciting moment to see a book like Lean In written by a Facebook executive, which meant that everybody was suddenly talking about gender at work in a way that I hadn't seen before. My excitement, though, quickly turned to disappointment. Cheryl Tamberg and Lean In is very specific that her advice that women need to raise their hands more, take their seat at the table, be more confident is only one slice of the pie when it comes to what we need to do around gender equity. And yet I felt like corporate America had this moment where they wanted a fix, a quick solution to the challenges related to gender gaps at work. And in Lean In, they found it. We have a culture that likes sound bites. Not only is Lean In something that you can consider bullet points on a slide, but it's literally just two words. And so as I would talk to women at my organization, but across industries, across types of organizations, I kept hearing this, this common refrain, which was that young women were constantly being told, no matter what the challenge was, that the answer was to lean in. It was a way of simplifying the challenges related to gender as if it was completely our fault. And so I, I'll say I got a little obsessive. I started 
doing really it ended up being hundreds of conversations over almost a decade with women across industries trying to understand the different challenges folks were facing. I read just every single book and article I could get my hands on. I thought about my own experience and realized all the things that Lean In doesn't take into account. I'll just go through a few quickly now, but all of the ways that there are barriers that make it harder for women to lean in, the ways that when we do lean in, we're often unequally rewarded and unequally penalized. And also the ways that the way that we tell women constantly to lean in really overvalues stereotypically masculine traits, such as assertiveness, while undervaluing stereotypically feminine traits like collaboration, empathy, cross-cultural communication, things that are so important now than ever in modern leadership. That's when I decided I wanted to write about this topic. I ended up, as Sarah mentioned, writing Beyond Leaning In as a novel for a few reasons. First, well, I was obsessively, as I mentioned, reading all I could get my hands on. There's so much robust literature around everything that has to do with Beyond Leaning In, how it's not just about each woman's own responsibility, how it's about a community across genders to create support. But I also knew that know that people are busy. We're going from thing to thing to thing, nine o'clock meeting to 10 o'clock meeting to 11 o'clock meeting, emails in between. And most folks aren't gonna have the time or make the space to read a book that goes into the complexities of the gender gap and why we need to go beyond leaning in. I wrote the book as a novel, hoping that it would be a way to engage both men and women in the conversation through a story. There's also a lot of research by psychologists on how novels can help us build empathy. And so in Lean In, Beyond Leaning In, I go through the perspectives of multiple characters across genders and generations. And then finally, one thing that I'd noticed at organizations I was working at, but also consulting with, is that whenever diversity, equity, and inclusion conversations and trainings happen, they are filled with difficult emotions. People feel sadness, anger, frustration, guilt, shame, defensiveness, all of this can be really difficult to tackle in a one hour diversity, equity, and inclusion training crammed in the middle of your day. My hope is that a novel provides a way of engaging with these issues, both at a distance while developing empathy, and again, helps spark those types of difficult conversations. Uh, if you have a chance to check out my podcast, I have some examples there of folks reading Beyond Leaning In together and having some of those conversations we don't often have. There's one episode with a husband and wife who read Beyond Leaning In together and talk about their differing experiences. Uh, the one that dropped this week has two male millennial leaders who read the book together and are talking about what it means as a millennial man to talk about gender equity. What are some of the trends in millennial culture that can make it both easier and also harder for millennial men to participate as allies? Now, before I get into some of the key takeaways from my research, I did want to spend a little bit of time talking about how I define allyship. There are a lot of definitions out there. I think of allyship in terms of three principles. The first is understanding the lived experience of our colleagues and the challenges they face that are different than ours. Today, we're talking about gender, but that could be related to any number of identity categories. The second is finding ways to support these colleagues in overcoming the barriers they face, both individually, how can we help a colleague when we see them experience bias, for example, but also systemically and culturally, what are the ways that we can think about the policies and processes and cultural norms that disadvantage some of our colleagues over others. And then finally, and this is a key point that I don't think gets talked about enough, is that allyship can and must occur in all directions. And by that, I mean within an organization, downwards, sideways, and upwards. I think of that generationally. So one key challenge to gender equity is there are a lot of generational differences between millennials and younger Gen X and how they view gender equity and allyship, and then older Gen X and boomers. That was a constant theme throughout my research. But I also think about it within levels within an organization. One of the most frequent themes in my research was younger women saying that they wish that they saw more support from 
senior women who didn't necessarily, they felt, understand the challenges they face. I also heard that in reverse. I heard from many senior female leaders that they felt that both younger women and men that they managed that were on their teams sometimes were subject to unconscious biases themselves and had different expectations of what they thought that female leaders should do for them versus male leaders and that that tended to well. So I think we sometimes think about allyship just as sideways or just about you know men being allies to women, but actually there are lots of different ways to define allyship. What we'll do today before we head into Q&A is overview four of the key takeaways from my book and research about what it means for organizations to go beyond leaning in and think about allyship. For each one, I'm actually gonna do something a little bit different today. I'm gonna use a few comics that I've drawn based on the book. Um, I'm gonna be upfront with you. I am not a classically trained artist, but I believe anyone can and should draw and that comics and illustrations are really just a fun way to engage people in difficult concepts and get our creative juices flowing. I've actually started to use workshops that use these comics to reflect and plan next steps around workplace equity. Um, if you're interested in any of those workshops, I'm doing a few free ones over the summer that I'll be emailing about on my mailing list and you'll get information about that at the end of the, the presentation. Um, I also will provide a link at the end of the presentation and I think Sarah's also putting it in the chat so that you could download these slides. I wanna leave, time for Q&A, so I'm actually gonna go through these pretty quickly, but you'll be able to get the slides to look at them in more depth. And there are also reflection questions throughout the slides that you'll be able to use later as well. So with that, I am going to share my screen. Again, we're going through four key takeaways from Beyond Leaning In. And the four themes we're going to discuss today, first, I already mentioned this a little bit, but we'll talk a little bit more about the generation gap. Second, a concept I call points versus assists. I know March Madness is over, but um, still feels like uh, basketball metaphors we can still use. Um, third, a concept that I call mental autocompletes. And fourth, one of the most important phrases when it comes to allyship is intent versus impudence. So starting with the generation gap, uh, this is a comic I drew that was inspired by one of my favorite movies, My Big Fat Greek Wedding, where the mom at one point says to the daughter who is frustrated because she feels like her father is always taking charge and that the mom doesn't have a say. The mother says to her, the man is the head of the house, but the woman is the neck and she can turn the head any way she wants. And at the bottom, I depicted a mother and daughter watching this together. And the mother says, remember that at work too. get men to think things are, are their idea. And the daughter says, I don't know, mom, there's got to be another way. And this was a common theme throughout my research when it came to the generational differences. I think what I heard from many younger women, uh, younger Gen X, millennials, is that they felt like, Previous generations had to fight so hard to get where they did, had to overcome all kinds of explicit biases, all kinds of biased policies, that there were some things they kind of said, well, this is just the way it is. And a lot of that has to do with ways that women have to soften, have to raise statements as questions, get, thing, get men to think things are their idea, that older generations say, this is how it is, this is what we need to do to get ahead. And younger generations are saying, okay, maybe that's what we need to do, but there's gotta be another way. How do we stop that? How do we stop that culturally so that this isn't the way that women get their point of view across at work? Another interesting point in my research was that it actually wasn't just about women that generational differences also, when it comes to gender equity, also relate to how men of younger generations view work compared to of older generations. And in this comic, what I wanted to show is a little bit of a Venn diagram. On the left side, things women have historically valued at work more than men did. And on the right side, things younger generations, both men and women value at work more than previous generations 
things like authenticity in leadership, inclusive culture, work-life balance, personal meaning in work is where you see the overlap between those two. That's what actually gives me hope when I think about why we could see changes when it comes to gender equity. It is because younger generations and what women have valued historically, there is such that overlap and an overlap, especially when it comes to things like authenticity and inclusivity, where we can hopefully have some of those more honest conversations about concepts like we saw on the previous slides where women feel like they have to soften or phrase their statements at question as questions in order to be heard. Again, as I mentioned, I won't go over these reflection questions. They are here if you'd like to use them yourself or with teams that you're in after this session. And again, you can get the slides later. Second, I wanna talk about a concept called points versus assists. And this really has to get, this really gets at the challenge of how women are often socialized to behave at work and how men are socialized to behave at work. And I'm saying work, but I think this applies in academic classrooms as well, that women are often being told to talk louder, to interrupt, to take up space, ways that men have been socialized to behave. Uh, on my podcast this week, you'll hear two male leaders who actually talk about remembering being, so in one case, remembering being socialized to talk louder and to interrupt more. Now, the question that I raised in my research is, well, are men being told to listen and amplify others' voices like women are socialized to do? And how do we get to a place where we see more balance? There's a great book that I often recommend called Own the Room by Amy Sue. And she talks about the difference between voice for self and voice for others. And how for every person, whether you're an employee or a student, there's an importance of balancing your voice for self and your voice for others. The challenge though, as we see in this comic is that often men are taught to value that voice for self. Women are often taught to value that voice for others. We actually need both in any workplace, but in so many workplaces, it's the, here's the basketball metaphor, it's the points versus the assists that tend to be dominant in meeting culture. This is actually something I noticed, I, um, Sarah mentioned, I got my PhD in English at UCLA. It's something I actually noticed in graduate seminars. There were several seminars I was in where, you know, in, in a group of about 15 people, maybe 70 to 80% would actually be women and we'd have 20 to 30% men and a male professor. And even though that was the gender balance of the room, as far as representation in some of these seminars, there were a lot of women. When it came to the talking, it actually was the reverse. The men would probably do about 70% of the talking. One thing that I had observed was that there was something about the spatial dynamics of the room because we had at one head of the table, a male professor, and at the other head of the table was where all the male students would cluster. And they would volley back and forth ideas. It actually almost felt to me like watching a tennis match where they could easily ignore the woman in their peripheral vision. After noticing this, uh, and we did this twice, my colleagues and I had an idea. We said, well, what if we change the seating dynamics of the room? And without telling anyone, uh, or without telling the, the professor, uh, twice we would get to class 10 minutes early and try this out, the woman actually took all the seats at the heads of the table and one side and left the male professor and the men in the class to sit on one side. And what was interesting about it for us was that when the men couldn't look at each other and volley back, they actually participated in a very different way. And the woman also participated in a different way. So the conversation became less about different people trying to get their contribution in, interrupting each other, wanting to get that point advancing one's own individual viewpoint and contributions as you see on the left side, and more about assists, amplifying each other's voices, listening, advancing the organization or the classroom's collective's aims. That doesn't always mean everybody's agreeing each other or calling each other's ideas out, though that's part of it. It also means even knowing when somebody is disagreeing and wanting that viewpoint in the perspective, again, because the goal is for the group to get smarter that includes incorporating conflict rather than each individual person to score points. Uh, again, a reflection exercise. 
The third concept that I want to talk about is mental autocompletes. And again, I know I'm going quickly so that you can um, all get these slides later and we have some time for questions, but the mental autocomplete is my way of talking about unconscious biases. And on the left side of the slide, the reason why I use the phrase mental autocomplete is I've found that the word unconscious bias can lead people to shut down. I've seen so many diversity, equity, and inclusion trainings, where as soon as folks hear the word unconscious bias, including people who really want to be good allies, it, it leads to defensiveness because bias is a word that we see as a negative. Here's how a mental autocomplete works. Uh, when the iPhone first rolled out its autocomplete emojis a few years ago, there was a problem. When you typed in CEO, you got a male emoji. When you typed in doctor, you got a male emoji. There wasn't an option for female emojis. Now, of course, the iPhone didn't mean to be biased, but it was programmed to think of CEOs and doctors as men. Now, I think the important thing about allyship is realizing how much different groups, and here we're talking about women, face mental autocompletes every day. On this comic, I wanted to show a few examples. At the top one, this is one I've experienced a million times, where a woman is the one who asked for the check, maybe even gave the server her credit card, and yet the server brings the credit card back to the man. I've myself experienced this uh, so many times as a leader taking my staff out, um, folks who might clearly look younger than I am, even if I have the credit card, my name is on it, I ask for the check, nine times out of 10, the credit card goes back to the man. Um, second example, one I'll hear often is how women and men get described to each other. So here we have someone, I'm excited to meet the team, maybe a new employee, and the person introducing them to the team says, hey, we're gonna meet Chad and Haley. They're both marketing directors. Chad is so smart and amazing with data. Haley, she's the glue of the office. Women are often described in these softer terms, glue of the office, or she has an infectious smile, not necessarily related to their work accomplishments or their academic accomplishments. And then below this, this is a scene from my book where our CEO, Deborah, she is in the middle of the strip is at a reception and a young man comes up to her and her CFO and just starts talking to the man. Jack, I wanted to, um, sorry, there's a missing word there, introduce myself. I saw in the program, we went to the same business school. I'm very interested in your company. And she's thinking, well, my bio is before Jack's in the program. Uh, I actually went to the same business school too. I'm the CEO, but this guy is acting like I'm not here. Now, why does this happen? It's because autocompletes are so pervasive that they can overpower the facts. The server's programming is that men pay the bills. That overrides all of the evidence, the woman's name on the credit card, the fact that she asked for it. In the bottom left, he ignores the female CEO because she doesn't fit the image in his head of who can help him. Again, it's all of that unconscious wiring, ignoring, overpowering the facts. And on the right side, I wanted to show this was the example of Chad and Haley, that both women and men can have faulty wiring that leads to describing, for example, men by technical skills and women by social skills. Bias can be internalized. Bias can be done by women towards other women, again, because all of this is in our programming. There are a few types of mental autocompletes. I won't go through all of these today. Uh, the opportunity gap that relates to even in entry level positions, men and women getting different kinds of assignments and how that actually plays out over time because with each unequal assignment, that means that men are getting a leg up for the next one. Uh, what's called in-group favoritism versus out-group bias, internalized bias, benevolent, sex, benevolent sexism, which is when women are treated as if they're fragile and so not being given the same amounts of opportunities or assignments. And then finally, the one I'll show a few comics on is performance assessment bias. I think of this in terms of both penalty and in terms of reward. So in terms of penalty, this is one I've seen many times, both in classroom settings and in workplace settings. Here in a workplace setting, two staff hear about a new policy they dislike. Shannon, 
in the meeting, this is a scene in my book, complains in a brusque tone. Dan, on the other hand, slams his laptop shut and storms out of the room. Now, later that day, when Shannon and, Dis and Dan are discussed by folks who have power over their careers, the conversation about Shannon is that she can't control her temper. It'll really limit her career. The conversation about Dan, he can't control his temper, but he's a good guy. Nobody's perfect. There is also a lot of research on what's called the bet with versus prove it again phenomenon. I wanted to show an example here with two characters in my book. Chad is inexperienced, but he did a great job on that project. Let's bet with and promote him. Haley on the right side did a great job on that project, but she's inexperienced. We'll have to see more. Now you can see here in both cases, they need to gain more experience. In both cases, they did a great job on what project. In both cases, there's a but. But in Chad's case, the but is a positive. He has potential, let's bet with him. And in Haley's case, the but is a negative. Reflection exercise. Finally, we'll look at intent versus impact. Uh, this is our, our last comic. If you wanna see my full set of comics, uh, you can follow me on Instagram at the handle below. Uh, and this one, we have a promotion memo. This is a fairly common phenomenon. It also occurs in letters of recommendation. Congrats, Mike and Mara, for their promotions to analytics manager. Mike led the analysis for a critical project that led to $5 million in revenues. Mara has a fantastic work ethic and great baking skills. All of us have gained a few pounds from her cupcakes. Now, I think that this one is really important because we've seen this play out so many different times. And when folks are thinking about allyship, we often think about how to be allies for the big things. You know, you see somebody who's really experiencing harassment or experiencing explicit bias, or maybe even an ally who's trying to figure out how to help change a biased policy at the organization. These little things, they add up and they have a cumulative effect, but it's very easy to ignore them as unimportant. And that's why I wanted to show the character at the bottom left who's saying, you know, maybe he's even acknowledging that this is kind of weird that Mike is being acknowledged for the revenues and that Mara is being acknowledged for the banking skills. But it's also saying, what's the big deal they both got promoted? Well, on the right side of the comic, you can see what the big deal is. In this fictional company, you can imagine that some of the people who read the memo maybe know Mike and Mara really well and know a lot more about Mara than her baking skills. But there are probably a lot of people who don't know them that well. And this promotion memo is how they're learning about these two individuals in their workforce. So when somebody here you see is looking for project help, maybe even three, six months later, maybe even a year later, and is asking a colleague, what do you know about Mike or Mara? Her response, She's not sure how she knows these things, but she's heard Mike is great. Don't know much about Mara. Why is that? Because people, after reading this memo, remember Mike for the revenues and Mara for the cupcakes. Thinking about those mental autocompletes, they start young. They start in how women and men, boys and girls are portrayed in children's books, but they're constantly reinforced. They're constantly reinforced every time we see a memo like this or every time we are introduced to men and women and the men are introduced through their technical skills or their revenue uh, skills and the women are introduced by things like being the glue of the office or having the interests. Um, I've, I've been glossing over the reflection exercise, but this is a comic that I use a lot in my workshops to help people reflect on diversity, equity, and inclusion, and also what needs to change. And so through drawing exercises, we look at what's the impact on Mara individually, what could be the negative impact on the business, and what are all the reasons why the cupcake memo happens and how to come up with interventions. I mentioned earlier, I think anyone can draw, and to me, drawing isn't about creating something. None of my comics are ever gonna be in an art museum. I think of drawing as a way of expressing ourselves, freeing our minds a little bit to think differently. And so through drawing as thinking, we can begin to envision, okay, what's the next step after uh, the comic that I call the cupcake trap. 
I went ahead to Q&A now, but if you sign up for my mailing list, uh, you can get updates on my work, including the free workshops this May and June that will be based on the comics. And you can also get these slides that way. It's at melanieho.com backslash philosophy. Um, also feel free to email me if you have any questions, ideas. I love hearing from folks. And so with that, I will stop sharing so we can get into Q&A. Amazing. Thank you so much, Melanie. That was very, very inspirational and interesting. It's crazy how kind of slight changes in wording can really matter so much and be um, so impactful, especially like sometimes unconsciously how we do it. Um, as Melanie said, I want to open it up to Q&A. So in the, I know everyone's new at Cvent, but in the Cvent chat, um, on the right hand side, you should be able to see a little Q and A on the um, a little Q and A thing that you can open up and you can type in your chat and we will go ahead and get started. Um, there is a question already, um, or actually quite a few. So the first one um, I'm going to address is submitted by Noah. Um, so Noah says, "Thank you so much for speaking today, Melanie." Um, he was curious how our tactics for allyship should change depending on whether we are seeking to be allies laterally or vertically. Oh, that's a great question. You know, I think that there are, there are similarities in terms of first just understanding where the person is coming from and that it's often easier to understand where the person's coming from laterally because what you are needing to think about is primarily where your differences in identity might impact their experience and not necessarily where your differences on the organizational ladder impact your experiences. Uh, if you're an ally above or below, there's that extra dimension of okay, not just this person's experience, but also what are they trying to get done in their job and how is their identity impacting that? I think that's why allyship upward, while incredibly important, is especially challenging. A lot of times people don't think about the fact that they need to be allies upward, um, but actually what can help women and people of color significantly is having really that kind of <laughs> almost all like grassroots support. And that's hard to do because there's multiple barriers to it. There's understanding perspectives unlike yours, but then that also that perspective also includes that their jobs are very different, um, that they may not feel as able to be open about the biases that they face, even though they're facing them. So it does require that extra level of, of effort and ability to have honest conversations. Hey, thank you so much. And just for everyone that um, is aware, hopefully you guys can see the questions um, that have been approved, um, but you can also upvote as well. So keep submitting questions. Um, and hopefully this works. I'm gonna stop and display this. So the next question is um, submitted by David. Um, so um, David says, thank you for these incredible insights, Melanie, and beautiful, um, web comics as well. <laughs> um, how can we foster uh, more assist focused cultures when compensation in organizations uh, traditionally re traditionally rewards points? That is a wonderful question. Um, and I'm going to free associate a little bit. I, so one of the ways to do it is actually to think about incentives and performance reviews. And I think more organizations will add things like firm values on it or actually have specific um, marks for collaboration. I know some teams that even have regular, not necessarily 360 reviews, but, but surveys of staff to get a sense of how they're doing at collaboration. Um, so I think that that is one way that helps. Another probably though has to just, has to do with changing how we think about organizational goals and timing and, and what I call organizational impatience, which I think is one of the biggest things that plagues DEI efforts, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts is this desire for quick wins and that every single interaction needs to lead to a solution right away. Um, in meeting culture, that can just be about being more explicit. There, there are different kinds of meetings that have different purposes. So there are some meetings where at the end of 30 or 60 minutes, the goal is to get to an end result collaboratively. And 
Uh, you know, the, the goal is maybe efficiency and maybe in efficiency that, that doesn't mean assists aren't important, but the assists are towards that goal of efficiency and we're seeing how is everyone contributing to it. There are some meetings where maybe the entire goal of the meeting is just to define a problem and that that's okay. And I think that part of the points versus assists problem is that we often don't know what the purpose of a meeting is. So then the purpose of the meeting ends up being about everybody, you know, kind of trying to show off a little bit um, or trying to figure out how they can uniquely contribute. Whereas if the purpose of the meeting is more clear, it's a little bit easier to rally around that. There's a book I love called, um, it's a, also a business book written as a novel called Death by Meeting by Patrick Lencioni. And he does a great job just breaking apart the different kinds of meetings and the different goals for each. That was great. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, okay, I will move on to the next question. Um, okay, so the next question um, is, what is one thing you think an organization can implement today to increase allyship in the workplace? So really kind of a direct, um, what are actions that can be taken? You know, one concept I love that I haven't seen enough organizations um, do, but is, is one I explore a lot in the book is reverse mentorship. And you know, we think of mentorship usually as somebody more senior helping somebody more junior. And I, I think that I'm starting to see movement towards reverse mentorship that actually saying managers at any level, but especially when they get more senior, would really benefit from somebody who's more junior who can help them understand their perspective. A lot of that is related to identity because so many organizations are lopsided and have a disproportionate you know, ratio of men at the top, but actually also relates to a lot of other things about workplace culture and, you know, often more junior staff are actually closer to the customer, um, see challenges that senior folks don't see. And so I think there's so many advantages to reverse mentorship, one of them being related to diversity and identity, but others as well. Awesome. I'm going to ask a quick follow up on that, actually. So in reverse mentorship, do you mean kind of um, someone that's maybe, I guess, lower down or not as senior in a company um, being a mentor to someone that is more senior? Or do you mean kind of a woman to a male being mentors or how does that kind of? Oh, yeah. So I met someone more junior mentoring somebody more senior. And some organizations do it just just that in a directional and, and some do it both ways. So you know, you're kind of figuring out in the mentoring relationship, where is the more senior person supporting the more junior person? And where is the more junior person supporting the more senior person? And, you know, it's, it, that's evidence, I think, of, a, of an organization that has a learning culture where everybody realizes that they can constantly learn no matter what level you are and, and from who. If organizations don't want to go all the way to reverse mentorship, um, which I do think everyone should do, but there are also just ways that individual managers can use, you know, skip levels or double double skip levels, um, just regularly meeting with not just their direct reports, but below that and below that and using the conversations more. Uh, yeah, I want to say informally, even though that's not the right word, but to get at more of these just yeah, not for an item on the agenda, how is this project going, but actually to focus in on culture. Got it. Awesome. Thank you for that, that clarification. Um, our next question um, is submitted anonymously, but it's based on your research and experiences. How do you, how do things differ for women of color compared to um, white women? And are there needs for this type of allyship um, as well? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that gets at the um, yeah, intersectionality is so important to think about the multiple identities that anybody is bringing into the workforce and how to understand that intersection. So I know myself as an Asian American woman, I have certainly experienced a lot of gender bias, but also experienced a lot of the challenges related to race. For example, there have been so many times in my career 
where somebody upon meeting me for the first time will say they were surprised that I was funny or surprised that I was opinionated. And, and to me, that's code for an unconscious bias that they don't expect an Asian American woman to be funny and opinionated. I should be, I don't know, like meek and playing piano somewhere or something like that. And yeah, just one example, but I, I do th think that that's important is to think through all this, the number of different identities we all show up to work with and the colleagues show up to work with. That's great, thank you so much. Um, the next question is from Alam. Um, so Alam says, thank you for the presentation, Melanie. What are some ways ally allies can try to change the work working environment structurally to be more supportive? Um, and thinking in the vein of your moving the chairs example from um, the PhD seminars. Mm -hmm. So I, there's, there's sort of what one can do individually and there's what one can do in terms of changing the system. I think individually there's so much allies can do with just you know, being aware in a meeting. Um, whose voice can you amplify? You know, is there one, I'm, I'm thinking of one fantastic male ally I worked with in my previous job who would notice when a woman tried to speak up and was interrupted and would actually make a point of saying, hey, Anne, I, you were trying to say something earlier. Um, and who would know this, for example, even when introducing, we'd have a client meeting and a, a man might introduce himself at the client meeting and actually talk a lot about himself. And then a woman goes next and introduces herself and actually downplays herself in her accomplishments. And I once saw the same male ally right after that, when he introduced himself, actually added to the woman's introduction and did it in a way that didn't seem paternalistic. It was, oh, you know, Anne, oh, Anne didn't mention she also does X, Y, Z. And so I think it's just finding all of those opportunities where you see that a colleague's voice needs to be amplified and, and being able to do it. I think that's on, a, um, on an individual level. Another one on an individual level is actually helping take on the emotional labor um, when it comes to explaining inequity, whether related to gender or, or um, any other identity category, you know, I think a lot of the challenges I've found for women is that we often bite our tongues when it comes to gender equity. And the biting the tongues is for a few reasons. One is not knowing if saying something will do something. Another reason women often bite their tongues is not wanting to do the emotional labor of having to explain what's going on. Um, allies who read, uh, who ask questions and listen, but also who help do some of the explaining. Uh, yeah, I've, I've worked with men who want to be good allies, but sadly, they're going to be more likely to listen to a man who tells them there's gender bias than a woman who tells them there's gen their gender bias. And I don't want that to be the case. And it frustrates me that that's the case. But sometimes I've actually said to male colleagues, hey, so-and-so doesn't get it and I've tried to explain it and they're not getting it and I can't keep trying to explain it, I need you to. And I've seen a big difference there. So there's a way that allies can recruit other allies. Um, then when it comes to policies, there are so many different things organizations can implement like competency-based hiring, simulation interviewing, just different ways that the whole hiring, promotion, recruiting, everything in talent management happens. And I think all too often it is the groups that are most marginalized who end up doing the extra work on those efforts where um, just having more allies be a part of advocating for those policy solutions can help too. That was great. Thank you so much. Um, so the next question, and just as a reminder, because I see we have quite a few questions, um, you can also upvote if any of these questions look I'm particularly interesting to you. Um, so the next question is, um, if working in an environment that is mostly male dominated, what are best practices in asking for allyship from your colleagues and leadership? So I think again, some of that is finding, um, there's a few, so I'll say one of them on a more personal level is finding the folks that you feel most comfortable with and you think are most likely to be good advocates. It's just identifying the 
play like leverage points and leverage points probably two ways, just like anything. It's both willingness to have the conversation and be a part of it, but also probably an ally who has power and influence. Um, so who do you think can, who will get it, but also will be able to do something about it? Um, I think the second is helping your organization understand the real business or even if it's a nonprofit, the, the impact on organizational goals if there are equity, uh, diversity, equity and inclusion problems. And I think of this a few different ways. You know, there's a lot of research on how um, more diverse organizations and leadership teams lead to success. I find that people are skeptical of those, that those make good talking points, but that leaders are actually skeptical. Um, when they are less skeptical, a few reasons, a few things that make them less skeptical. One is if they have boards or the public putting pressure on them. So that's, that's kind of ideal where we need to aspire to, but that's longer term. Um, second, they're less skeptical when they see a direct impact. So if they actually do the math and start to see, okay, you know, maybe we're male dominated, but we still have female employees or employees of color and um, you know, we actually do need to retain them. <laughs> and if, if folks actually see retention data, that can make a difference. Um, and actually any kind of data. So even sort of qualitative data with, hey, you know, here's, here's the list of, employees across the last few years who actually departed. And um, we can see that they're disproportionately women and, and that's a problem. Um, the other I think of as just helping organizations understand where current cultural practices are getting in the way of equity, but also getting in the way of business. I talked about organizational impatience a little bit earlier. Um, there's this wonderful book for allies, for male allies, which I recommend called Four Days to Change. And it's by a company called uh, White Men as Full Diversity Partners. And the, the um, bulk of the story is, is about four, I think four or five white men who spend several days together just talking about what it means to be a white man and what, what white male culture is. And they start off by saying, you know, white male culture isn't even something people think about specifically. Uh, but by the end of it, they start getting into these cultural norms. And one of them is the need for action instead of reflection. And I think that's that might be in the book, it's described as a white male cultural norm. But I actually think that's an organizational norm and a, cult, and a corporate America norm is action versus reflection. You know, we need the quick wins. What is harder to show organizational leaders, but I actually think that that you can do is where that tendency toward quick wins actually slows the organization down. So if you make the wrong hire, that's one that happens a lot is um, the wrong hires are often made because it's easier to find somebody in your network. Um, and it's easier just to look at what school they went to rather than actually look at, uh, try to get a diverse recruiting pool or, or, or try to use competency-based hiring to find the right person. And that's a very clear one where you can show that the quick action uh, rather than the more deliberate process might seem like it's a short-term gain, but in the long-term is actually going to be a bad business outcome. Awesome, thank you. Sorry, I had to <laughs> quickly go off mute. <laughs> um, so the next question is, and I apologize, I'm gonna um, probably mispronounce this, but Australia, um, when we experience gender, age, or cultural bias directed to ourselves or others, how do we address it in the moment without coming across as angry or as confrontational? That's a, a great question. And I think that's where intent versus impact can help a lot. And I, I it, it, it's also very situational as to whether it makes sense to address in the moment versus to address later. I think there often is advice to always address in the moment. And I tend to disagree with that, that sometimes we need to address in the moment, um, but sometimes afterwards actually is helpful. So in the, in the moment is easier if you already have a culture that's Kind of decided that this is something we're going to do. So for example, at my last firm, we talked a lot about 
bias in performance reviews. And twice a year, leadership teams would get together and do our career committee where we'd go through all of the staff and uh, discuss their performance. And often you'd hear biased comments unconsciously during those. And so one thing we started doing was actually before every one of those sessions, having a discussion around bias in performance reviews and what the common biases are, and then saying, um, I forgot what phrase we used and we changed it every time, but it was sort of like a perspective check. So if you heard somebody say something that wasn't quite right, you would just say, you could raise your hand and just say perspective check and nothing else. And so it was a way of depersonalizing it. Like, this is just the system. This is just the process. I'm not calling you out. I'm just saying we all need to check our perspective here. I think that can help a lot when you set that culture and that can make in the moment calling it out easier. Um, sometimes I think that it is easier afterwards. And because what you need to have is a, a conversation around it. I love the book, Difficult Conversations, which is not about bias, but is just helpful for everything. And uh, unrelated to that book, I love, uh, I had the phrase in my slides, but I didn't talk a lot about it, the phrase intent versus impact. And this is one I learned from the, um, a woman named Jessie Bridges, who was the chief diversity officer at my old firm. And I had an experience in a meeting where a senior man who was actually a mentor of mine undermined me in the meeting. He kind of um, said some said a few things that were incredibly patronizing. And I actually had a recording of it because it, it was pre-COVID, but it was a meeting with a lot of sales folks who were on the road. And so it was recorded for them to listen to later. So I actually played it for our chief diversity officer because I felt like, am I imagining things? Am I being too sensitive? And she said, no, you're not. Actually, he's a senior person who had more power than you. And he spoke to you either and any level of power. He spoke to you in a way that was patronizing. And um, what she, she gave me three options and she said, we can have a training on microaggressions for your department. Um, I can have, you can have someone in HR do a coaching session with him on intent versus impact, or you can have a conversation with him on intent versus impact. And I said, actually, I like the idea of all three. I don't want to do all the emotional labor. So I think if my HR person could do a coaching conversation, that's great. I think we do need training as a department, but training only goes so far. And like, I want to have this conversation with him. And so she gave me the language to do it, which is intent versus impact. The idea of intent versus impact. It's like if somebody steps on your foot while you're walking down the street, they didn't mean it, but it still hurt and it still wasn't good. And so I was able to have a conversation with this gentleman that's saying, I know your intent is good. I understand that there were stresses in the meeting, why you spoke to me this way. Um, you've been a great, good mentor to me. And you know, I, I realized your, your intent was not to undermine a woman in this meeting, but let me tell you about the impact and why it mattered. And just having that language helps depersonalize it. Um, but it is something that required a a longer conversation and did require a little bit of emotional labor on my end, which was why I was glad that our chief diversity officer had those other options too, because I could have chosen not to do the emotional labor and actually had him get the coaching conversation. That was great, thank you. Um, I'm gonna quickly run through, I know we only have five minutes left um, just to kind of give everyone a heads up, but um, we'll go to the next question um, submitted by Vivian. Um, so Vivian says, thanks, Melanie, for the discussion. In situations when female leaders are associated with activities such as bringing cupcakes, um, should female leaders limit such behaviors to a minimum level so that professional accomplishments would shine through? Oh, that is a tough one. And, uh, you know, because I, I want to say no, and yet I kind of am going to say Yes, yeah, sort of. And so I, I think it really depends on where you are in your career. The more senior I got, the more I actually um, stopped trying to modulate myself. I have given advice to more junior women to um, just be mindful of it, that I, I don't need to stop bringing in the cupcakes. I like baking too. And I think that it's a good way of building community. Um, but I think and I, while there are ways to even the load, right, there are ways to say, okay, if, if I think that having baked goods at meetings actually does make them better, which like personally I do, um, you know, do we create a sign-up sheet? And do we create a sign-up sheet so that everybody in the meeting can participate um, and different people are bringing it different times? And maybe if you really like baking, you can sign up three times. 
Um, but there's still a process by which it's not always the woman going out of, out of her way. Um, but I also have advised to women, you know, maybe think about when you're doing it, not every single time, or think about um, how you're doing it, how you're, you're even introducing the cupcakes, you know, into the meeting. <laughs> um, that, that one... Honestly, you can see I feel very conflicted <laughs> on this one, and I'll I'll be honest about it. I will say that the, I am a also a big believer in bring your whole self to work. I have I had stuffed animals in my office that previous employees <laughs> gave me. I um, I'm not someone who wanted to modulate all the time, um, but I was always conscious of the fact that when I wasn't modulating there might be a consequence and that I would have to mitigate the disadvantages of those consequences. Awesome. I think we're gonna have time for one more question. Um, so the last question um, has been submitted by Olivia. Um, so Olivia says, thanks so much for your presentation, Melanie. Um, do you have an opinion about some of the research that has come out about how unconscious bias trainings can actually be harmful um, to POC or people who have the trainings um, and are supposed to help? Yeah, I, I have very mixed feelings about unconscious bias trainings. Um, I do think that they can be harmful in many ways. So some of the research says that they uh, the many reasons why they can be harmful. They can be harmful because they can call attention to biases people didn't even think about. Um, they can be harmful because, uh, the main reason I think they can be harmful is because they lead organizations to think that they've done something when they haven't. And so I think for a lot of organizations, they're sort of a patting themselves on the back after an unconscious bias training. It often does feel even worse for people in the room. And sometimes that's because unconscious bias trainings are done poorly. They're done in a way that's meant to make everyone feel comfortable rather than deal with difficult issues. Um, I once experienced an unconscious bias training where it started with people discussing really difficult challenges that especially people of color face. And then it ended with everyone discussing bias against employees who don't drink and um, that they needed to have more you know, events that weren't happy. And that's a really important topic, but it shouldn't be in the same meeting. And it was a way for the group to not tackle the uncomfortable topic. And so I, I think, unconscious bias trainings, unless you have the space and the amount of reflection afterwards and the amount of reflection before and just this entire trapping of um, the trappings of ways to make it effective can backfire. And then even more than that, they backfire because then organizations think they're done. I know we're about at time. So I also just wanted to say um, to everyone to feel free if we didn't get to your question to email me at any time. I, um, or message me on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, all, all the things. Thank you so much, Melanie. This has been a really insightful conversation and we're so lucky to have you here. Um, I think this is just, this is great. We, in the past, I know, haven't had as much allyship programming. So this is really helpful just to get the conversation started and to kind of include everyone in the conversation. I think that's extremely important and you did that very well during this speech and we're very excited to have you. So once again, thank you so much. Um, for the attendees, we will now be transitioning over to an energizer. Um, so that should be on your schedule. Um, it's the next link. You can go to kind of the my sessions tab in Cvent and then head over to that energizer. Um, but if you don't feel like going to the energizer, no problem. Um, the uh, welcome remarks will begin at 1010. So feel free to jump over there anytime between 10 and 1010 and, and we'll go ahead and get started there. But thank you guys so much for joining.